due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Remember, it's not paranoia when they're really after you. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by author Dan Kazita. Dan is the author of the fantastic book Toxic, which is a history of nerve agents from Nazi Germany to Russia. On this episode, we are going to discuss what is known about the coronavirus... We're also going to talk about the vaccines that have been brought out to combat the coronavirus. And we're also going to take a look at some of the myths and conspiracy theories around the virus. So it should be a jam-packed episode. I hope you enjoy it. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can support us in a few ways. First of all, please share this podcast with your friends, family and cohorts. Please do write a review on your favourite podcast app. Those reviews help people find the podcast. I now have a new Patreon friends of the podcast tier and that's the only tier now and if you select to do that you'll have my undying gratitude you'll get a free copy of my film the dry cleaner and once in a while i will i will do my best to put a little extra in there to make it worthwhile for you maybe some zoom drinks or a q a maybe a behind the scenes look at the making of this podcast if you do enjoy this podcast you may like my film the dry cleaner The Dry Cleaner is available on Amazon and iTunes. It's an 18-minute contemporary spy drama written and directed by myself. So if you have a spare 18, 20 minutes and you've uh, exhausted your Netflix and Amazon Prime, check it out. And please do write a review after you've seen it. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Dan, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Well, it's uh, great to be back. I had fun last time. So, Dan, just for the benefit of people who didn't listen to our last chat, which I think was, was it June last year? I've lost track now. Yeah, it was a while ago now. Yeah, ancient history. <laughs> yeah, so much has happened since then. But um, can you just tell us a little bit about your yourself and your past professional experience? Okay. My name is Dan Kazita. I spent, uh, I've spent all of a 30-year career uh, so far in protecting people against chemical, biological, radiological you know, weapons, terrorism, warfare, uh, things like that. And my, my experience has been a little bit of a cross-section of the emergency response and defense disciplines. I've, I've, I've done it in the military. I've done it in the, uh, uh, you know, in, in the emergency services. Uh, I worked in the White House. You know, I, I was at the White House military office during the anthrax scare in 2001, where all of a sudden I was the one guy who knew anything about anthrax vaccines. Um, and, you know, then I worked in the U.S. Secret Service, actually protecting uh, the president against chemical and biological and radiological threats. And now now I'm in sort of, you know, pundit mode. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an expert now. I, I write books and articles and I, 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 I do podcasts and I, I give learned talks. And I've most recently been appo- appointed uh, uh, associate fellow at uh, the Royal United Services Institute, where I hope to bring my my knowledge to them at, at the country's oldest think tank. Yeah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well, it's uh, no, it's great to have you back on, and um, it's great to have your expertise. And don't forget to mention you've got a great book out called Toxic, which we should um, definitely do a follow up interview on at some point. That's a really good book. Oh yes, yes, uh, yeah. In fact, um, the audio uh, version of my book is going to launch mm. in, in in April here, but. Yeah, so I've written this book on the history of nerve agents because, you know, when we're not dealing with, like, this worldwide plague, um, well, seemingly people like Sergei Skripal and uh, Alexei Navalny seem to get yeah. ill from nerve agents. So um, uh, my once quiet area of expertise and punditry uh, is it's been keeping me busy for a few years. Well, actually, when we spoke last year, obviously COVID was a relatively new thing and there was still a lot of uncertainty and unknowns and things like that. So um, can you sort of talk to us about what is now known about the virus, about how it works, how people are likely to catch it, and also how best to avoid it? As we know now, this is primarily... A- a respiratory virus. Okay, uh, it spread. This is it's it's called a coronavirus because when you look at it, it's it's basically it's basically a little sphere 
and it's got all these spikes around it. So if you look at it in a sort of 2D thing, it kind of looks like a crown, hence Corona. All right. Uh, it causes uh, a body-wide series of, uh, of inflammations. I think when we originally first started thinking about this, like it was flu or pneumonia or something like that, we, we, mm. we've gotten a really sort of lung-centric approach to it. Uh, uh, and that makes sense on a lot of levels because that's what makes people most acutely ill. Uh, and that's what seems to kill people. But really, it's a body-wide infection uh, of which... Uh, the, the 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 lung stuff is the is the stuff that and, uh, sends you to the hospital, and as we now talk about long COVID and things like that, you know some of the other effects around the rest of the body have a sort of a longer, slower burn. Um, but the way it works is uh, like any infectious disease among people, which could be viruses, bacteria, sometimes even fungus or you know parasites, things like that. There's this concept called the chain of infection. Okay, a chain of infection, it's really sort of a circular chain, if you can think of it. All right, so that really, you start out with some sort of microorganism uh, that causes disease, all right? Yeah. And then it needs a reservoir. It needs some place where it lives, where it's happy, where, in the case of viruses, viruses really only serve to do one thing, uh, which is to infect cells, hijack cells, and turn that cell into a little factory to make more viruses. So... Uh, a virus needs a reservoir, someplace where it's happy, okay? In the case of, uh, of, of COVID, that reservoir is people, okay? But, you know, with other diseases, that reservoir could literally be a reservoir. It could be water. It could be food. It could be livestock uh, and things like that. But most importantly, most importantly so far, that re the reservoir seems to be people. We've seen in Denmark, the reservoir theoretically could be in mink farms, things like that. But mm -hmm. if it's in a reservoir... The next link in the chain of infection is a, you know, portal of exit, for lack of a better term, a way that the, the uh, virus leaves the, uh, the, the reservoir. And so with COVID, that's usually uh, coughing, spitting, sneezing, exhaling. That's pretty much how it gets because uh, it gets out of us through the lungs. OK, we're typically not really sweating it out through our pores or things like that. Uh, but we do things like cough on our hands and we touch things or... If we sneeze, we sneeze on things and we cough, we, you know, those that aerosol of small little particles eventually settles out and touches things. And that leads to the next link in this chain of infection, which is some sort of mode of transmission. Yeah. Now, diseases can transfer by a lot of things. You know, if you start to think about mm. something like HIV, which is a virus, that's very much a contact thing, you know. Uh, bodily substances, you know, breaches in the skin, uh, uh, injections, needles, things like that. You don't get AIDS by coughing. Now, with a respiratory disease, you know, the mode of transmission is primarily airborne, okay? Uh, and even now, you know, that's that's the key thing. It's an airborne thing. Yes, we do still need to wash our hands and all that. And it's because we have an infallible ability as humans to do things like uh, touch our eyes, touch our, pick our nose, touch mm -hmm. our mouth, things like that. Um, there's, really, there's really very, very little evidence of, you know, people getting COVID just by shaking hands with somebody now or things like that uh it's it's primarily airborne and the contact hazard has to do with the fact that we're all breathing all over things mm. okay so and then the next link in this chain of uh infection is like a portal of entry some way it gets into the body you know through our nose and our mouth down into our lungs okay and then the the last link in the chain is a susceptible host somebody who doesn't have some kind of immunity to it or has an additional vulnerability, something that has already run down their immune system, because the human immune system is very complicated, uh, has lots of different features and things, and, so, and has both general and specific kinds of uh, immunities. Uh, and a lot of these general types of immunities, uh, what we would call the innate, in, innate uh, immune system, uh, give us a layer of protection. This is why it takes more than just one virus particle. It could takes something like 500 or 1,000 bits of, uh, of the SARS-CoV virus to make us sick. Yeah, yeah. That's because we have some general you know, defenses uh, to it. So all this chain has to be in a place where you start to get a pandemic, where the reservoir becomes not just an individual person. The reservoir becomes the entire population. And so things like lockdowns and vaccines and hand hygiene and social distancing – uh, masks, uh, all that stuff serves to somewhere try to break these these different links in this chain of infection. 
and no one of them are you know perfect. You know, there's people complaining about you know, well, masks are perfect. Well, they're not meant to be, no. but they they work to sort of degrade the links between these the, this necessary chain for the virus to jump yeah. from person yeah. to person to person. Does that make sense to you? It does. It does. And one one thing that just popped into my head, you sort of touched upon it. There's been a, how do I put it, a rather unpleasant um, kind of discussion about how COVID tends to affect slightly older people. But there's an attitude that's been growing, a sort of resentment attitude about, well, why is it younger people have to be locked down because older people are getting ill, which I find quite it's distasteful, really. Yeah. But um, so I suppose um, what's my question now? I'm not sure. But I suppose younger people can be affected by COVID just as badly as older people, can't they? Well, yeah, and we don't we don't have a real good handle on the so called long COVID. Mm. Okay, mm. Uh, and we don't we don't know if this sort of lays low and will make you uh, sort of uh, have long term disability. So yeah. if you're if you're 20 and you get sick with this. Are you going to have problems for the next twenty years, and thus affect your ability to 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 uh, you know you know finish education and you know take up a career? Uh, you know we don't we don't understand the long term effects of mm. this stuff. Mm. Just because we're focusing right now on the uh, acute illness, and indeed, yes, the older people are far more likely to fall over dead from it. Okay, as opposed to a long, slow burn of long COVID. And even if it's sort of one person in a thousand, if millions of people get that, you're talking you're talking about is this going to be the next chronic fatigue disorder, or the yeah. next or, you yeah. know, whatever we're we're going to look at? It. Is this the next? Um, is this the next sort of big lifestyle disease sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And focusing, strictly speaking, on rapid deaths in the elderly really only sort of looks at it from, from one, one perspective. So why has COVID led to global lockdown measures whilst other viruses such as the flu have not? Okay. Well, take a specific comparison with flu mm. because that's the one that comes up yeah. the most. I mean, you could compare it to something like Ebola or something like that too. But we, we, could, we could do these like-for-like -like comparisons all day. But I think it's... Uh, it is very instructive to do a comparison with with, with influenza. Mm. Okay, and so the, the the ways COVID is different than than your bog standard influenza. I want to caveat this mm. with you know influenza is actually a mixed bag of things, and there's a lots of different types of flu. And occasionally, a serious one comes along that it scares the hell out of us. I don't know if you remember. The bird flu uh, was it 2009, yeah. 2010, and, and swine flu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you 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 get you get you get flus that are more serious than others. But it's sort of the the general bog standard flu that we all get once every couple of years, things like that. Mm. Generally speaking, COVID has some clever ways to sneak past the body's immune system better than it can, and uh, better than the flu can. And some of that has to do with the fact that we have both specific and generic defenses against the flu built up, okay? Because we've all had the flu at some point. So we got some bit of antibody floating around. And a lot of us have had flu jabs, okay? Yeah. Uh, enough people have had flu jabs that that chain of infection to prevent a pandemic is a little bit harder. There is immunity floating around in the population, okay? That's one of the things. Some of the aspects of the illness are just different. Uh, flu, on average, has something like a two-day incubation period, whereas COVID can be up to 10 or 11 days, okay? So that's a longer period of time. So what that means is you can be sick and travel around. You, you can have this thing floating around in you, and you, can, you have a much longer window for what they call asymptomatic transmission, okay? The period of point, that period of time, you've been sick for a little while, uh, but you're not sick with any visible signs and symptoms. Yeah. So you'll have this period of time where you could be actively spreading it. That's a much narrow window with flu. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, it could be, it, it's, it's a wider window in time with COVID. So it gives it more time to spread from town to town, from city to city, from building to building, whatever, whatever geographic spread. Uh, it gives it more time to go around before anybody realizes a problem. Mm. There's a problem. Mm. Okay. Uh, also, once you are sick with it, you have a longer period of time wherein you're con contagious. If you're just down with the flu, it's only a, it's only typically a couple of days that you're really shedding the virus, and you know the rest of that is you're getting better. Uh, even with relatively moderate symptoms of COVID, you could be transmissible for ten days, and if you're really badly off, it could be two, uh, twenty or days or even longer. So that's part of the problem. Uh, then you get into just how it affects people. A much higher percentage of people require much more intensive 
you know, medical procedures to survive. It's a higher percentage of people to get more acutely ill, whether some of that has, has to do with the fact that we just don't have residual immunity built up to this particular thing. And also the medical system generally knows how to deal with flu. It's not a new thing. There's a knowledge base. There are specific medications for the flu. This was new, particularly a year ago. Everybody, you know, nobody knew what to do. Now, I mean, actually, death rates are down because there's a lot more. There's a lot more tricks up people's sleeves because you know these poor doctors. They've been seeing thousands of these cases. They, yeah. you know, you know, they they kind of have a knowledge base now. But, you know, doctors have had that knowledge base for flu for 50, 75 years. Mm, so mm, mm. all these things add up to a point where it be, if it if it starts to get out of a local area and become a global pandemic, then you do need lockdown measures because we're, all these things have sort of added up to society being behind the curve instead of ahead of the curve mm. and, and containing it. Mm, mm. Do you remember so when former President Donald Trump, uh, thankfully, yeah. uh, thankfully former... Uh, <laughs> Yes, thankfully. <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> when he 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 came down with COVID, and and now a bigger picture's come out since um, when it happened. And apparently, he did require oxygen and other things. He received some quite specialized treatment that yeah. seemed to get him out of hospital quite fast. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, convalescent antibody therapy is mm. basically when you get sick from from this disease, your body is creating antibodies, and antibody is a specific substance that attacks the virus by latching, literally attaching themselves to the virus or a part of the virus, either kill off the virus or make the virus such that other parts of the immune system will kill it off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you get sick or if you get a vaccination, your 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 part of your immune system are these things called T cells and B cells. And these B cells, they're, they part of their job is to acquire a memory of previous infections. Okay. So when they see it again, they know to quickly start producing an antibody. Yeah. And so if if you're just getting over an infection, you've got a lot of these antibodies floating around your system. Okay. So you could donate your blood plasma and, you know, clever chemistry can uh, suck these uh, antibodies out of your out, out of your blood plasma and give them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and that is going on as a therapy. Uh it's it's a sort of therapy where it it relies heavily on on people who were sick enough to be in hospital, really, uh, but not sick enough to die mm. uh, and recovered, but being healthy enough to donate plasma. It's the sort of thing where I don't think, you know, by the traditional mechanism of convalescent plasma, that, that there will ever be enough supply to have it for everybody who's sick. Now, there theoretically, there could be ways that you could manufacture these antibodies in in uh, you know, synthetically. I don't I don't think we're at that point yet. I, I'm sure somebody's working on that. Yeah, I know that. For example, that was one thing that people have been working on uh, in the unlikely event of uh, smallpox coming mm. back. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there really isn't a treatment for smallpox, but one of the ways to one of the ways theoretically is to develop a, you know. A, a, a synthetic antibody can be given for it. So that's, you know, antibody therapy is a thing, mm. okay? I don't think it's a silver bullet for a variety of logistical and practical reasons, but it certainly can save people on an individual basis who are acutely ill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what it won't do, it won't reverse organ damage and things like that. Mm. Oh, yeah. God, I've mean, been hearing about lung transplants. I mean, yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't even know how that works. I've seen some horrific pictures of people's lungs after COVID. It's terrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and and, and that's one of those things that there's been lung damage in people who thought they were asymptomatic, mm. you know. Uh, mm. uh, and so that's the whole, that gets back to the whole old versus young thing. And does that sort of thing predispose you for other lung problems later on? It's too early to tell. Uh, does it make you more vulnerable to lung cancer and mm. asthma? and mm. COPD and all these other things. Uh, it's it's just too early to tell. Yeah, yeah. One ray of hope uh, was towards the end of last year, a series of vaccines started to be developed that were effective against COVID-19. Yeah. So can you talk to us about sort of the fact there are different vaccines? So can you talk to us about the sort of different ones that are now available and how they work? Okay, I'm going to talk about four of them. Here in the UK, there's the Pfizer vaccine yep. and there's the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yep. Uh, there's also this other one called the Moderna vaccine, which is getting more uptake in the US. Yep. Uh, and there's been some press about a Johnson Johnson vaccine, but there's also sort of behind these in the queue, there are literally hundreds. Uh, there's a couple others floating around. There, I don't really know much about the Russian Sputnik vaccine. It sounds cool, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's a lots of different ways that vaccines can work. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
vaccines uh, vaccines could do a lot of different things and uh, over over the last you know particularly 30 or 40 years there's been a lot of uh, advances in, in in biotechnology genetics and all this stuff to uh, to to develop you know, more for lack of a better term more elegant and sophisticated mm. vaccines mm. Uh, these are very earliest vaccines. You go all the way back to, to Jenner and the first smallpox vaccines and Louis Pasteur and rabies uh, uh, jabs and things like that. Uh, from a microbiological standpoint, those are quite crude, heavy-handed tools. The current crop of vaccines we're looking at here are actually very clever. Uh, and, and a vaccine is basically, all a vaccination is, uh, is either a, is, is, is using some method to convince your body that it's been sick with the disease in question, and thus develop the memory, implant the memory, if you will, uh, so that if your immune system encounters this this hazard again, it, it says, okay, I know what this is, and I'm going to start making the antibodies. All right? Now, back to why we call it the coronavirus. Uh, the coronavirus has got what they call this spike protein. It looks like, like I said, it looks like a little ball with all these spikes on it. Um, those spikes are made of a specific protein, and those spikes are what are used to sort of. Those spikes have a have a specific role in getting into in, into the host organism. All right, so what you can do is develop a antibody that recognizes and reacts to that spike protein. All right, so that when the spike protein turns up, uh, the the human body says, "Oh shit! I know what this is. That spike body, uh, that spike protein, really only means, uh, yeah, COVID." So, all right, I know what to do. All right, now, so the Pfizer vaccine, which was the first one out, is a, it's a really clever bit of work. What they found was a way of using genetic material. In this case, what's called messenger RNA. All right, now, genetic uh, genetic codes can be encoded in DNA or RNA. DNA is more complicated. RNA is simpler. Now, we won't get down that road uh, too much. Uh, that's a whole other show, and I have to probably defer you to smarter people than me. But basically, the Pfizer vaccine is a little bit of this uh, RNA, which is designed to teach cells in your body to produce the spike protein, but nothing else. Not the rest of it. It encodes just the genetic sequence to make the spike protein. All right. And so they take this RNA, which is actually quite delicate. And put it in this little nanoparticle, all right? Uh, you know, a tiny little, literally like you know, envelope of grease because it's a, it's various lipids. Okay, yeah, so it's yeah. a yeah. That's why it has to stay cold. Okay, otherwise it just melts. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So when it, it when it when this vaccine's injected, a you know, special messenger RNA is taken up by cells in your body, and those cells in the body will produce the spike protein. Now the, your body says this spike proteins. This isn't some sort of infection. This isn't good. And so your body starts producing antibodies to deal with the spike proteins. Now, the spike proteins in and on themselves aren't going to make you terribly sick. Uh, it makes you feel a little bit off. That's why some people, you know, feel a bit, you know, out of sorts for a day or two after the Pfizer vaccine. Some people even have a little bit of a fever. Uh, there's, but there's no actual virus involved. There's, it doesn't actually cause an, an infection, per se. It's tricked your body into, uh, you know... It's it's tricked your body into making one piece of the of the infected uh, the the infective virus. So that's how the Pfizer vaccine works. Uh, and the Pfizer vaccine, because of the way it's packaged in this tiny little nanoparticle, does need to deep freeze. Uh, it needs to be used up within six hours of coming up to injectable temperature and all that and things like that. But it's it is actually highly effective. It comes in two doses. Uh, ongoing argument exactly how far the two doses apart should be. There's no easy answer for that yet. One dose is better than no dose. Two dose is better than one dose, even if there is a fairly big you know, interval between them. So. so that's the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna vaccine works pretty much on the same principle with this messenger RNA, but they've got some more proprietary technology, so it's not as fragile. It doesn't need to deep freeze. Okay. But it works pretty much on the same thing. This modified you know, you know, little bit of RNA to uh, trick enough cells in your body to produce the, the spike protein. Mm. The AstraZeneca vaccine tricks your body into making sp uh, sp uh, the spike protein, but does it a different way. Okay. What they've done is they come up with a different virus. They, they, they came up with an adenovirus. An adenovirus in humans is something that normally causes the common cold. Yeah. Right? 
But they found an adeno, uh, adenovirus, I, I think it's from, back, I think they got it from uh, chimpanzees. So, so they did several things. First of all, they modified this adenovirus so it doesn't actually replicate, okay? Mm -hmm. And then they implanted the genetic sequence uh, into it for producing the spike protein. So mm -hmm. this virus goes in, takes over a host cell, but the host cell doesn't actually pr reproduce the virus. Mm -hmm. The host cell just reproduces the spike protein. Yep. Okay. And so that in turn tricks you because it uh, tricks your body into doing the same thing. Oh, we got the spike protein. This is a foreign invader. Okay. We've got to, you know, we've got to develop antibodies for this. And uh, most recently, there's this Johnson and Johnson vaccine. All right. They've done pretty much the same thing. Okay. They've done the same thing that, uh, that AstraZeneca has done, only they're using a, a human virus that causes the common cold, but also have, for lack of a better term, you know, clipped its balls so it can't replicate, right? Yeah. And yeah. so it, car it carries a gene for the coronavirus into cells, and then, but that it's just the gene for making the spike protein. So it's the, it's the, it's the same thing. Mm. Uh, and Johnson Johnson uh, has done that well. They've been doing it for a long time in, in developmental work. Uh, some of the Vaccine candidates for use in HIV do the same thing, mm -hmm. and it's what they use. It's the tactic they use for their successful Ebola vaccine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is good in that it's it, it's it's pretty temperature stable as well. It doesn't need deep freeze storage and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, and they've tried it. They've 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 done trials in single dose and double dose. Uh, the Johnson Johnson vaccine looks to be pretty good in a single dose. So. Um, I mean, and part of this is the, the, the vaccines we have right now. You, you fight a war with the you fight a war with the army and the weapons that you have. That doesn't mean if the war goes on that you're not going to get new weapons and you know rearm your army with different things. Mm. So, if we we're having this a year from now when we're talking about you know trying to get the rest of the world, because it's going to take a long time for you know the developing world to get through this, we might have to we might be into a different set of uh, of uh, vaccines or modifications of these existing mm. vaccines uh, and that's going to lead where you're going to come i know you're going to talk about variants and, and new strains mm. and things mm. like that so I there's two things there's obviously the strains but i wanted to just quickly ask the silly question which led to this interview actually i personally had a I had a misunderstanding about the vaccine in that I was not sure if a relative after having the vaccine would be infectious to me because of the vaccine. So can you talk to us about why my concern was sort of unfounded? Yeah, uh, because you're not actually getting the disease with the vaccine. Mm. Okay, and you're not actually getting a traditional infection. You're getting what you're getting is basically science tricked your body into thinking it's getting an infection, but yeah. it isn't actually an infection. So it's nothing that you can spread. OK, it's used part of the uh, you know, all these vaccines use a clever mechanism to convince your body that yeah. it's in the midst of fighting off an infection, whereas it, it, it really isn't. OK, yeah. it's the equivalent. I mean, it's equivalent. It's the equivalent of robbing the bank with a with a with a with a squirt gun instead of a real pistol. OK, <laughs> the, 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 the police and the bank guards think it's a real pistol that mm. actually isn't. Mm. But you provoke the same reaction. Yeah. OK, yeah, got you. <laughs> uh, but. Oh, I this, uh, to carry the same metaphor, you can't actually shoot anybody with that squirt gun. Yeah, yeah. so an empty squirt gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there is no harmful in infection to spread. Now, I can see how people might get to this mm. misunderstanding because some of the oldest vaccines, mm. um, I mean, you go all the way back to the original vaccination. The word vaccine comes from the uh, Italian vaccinare, which means, uh, you know, cow. Mm. Uh, was the idea that, you know, the discovery that, you know, if you give somebody an infection from cowpox, which just causes just a blister on your arm, uh, that provokes enough immunity in the human system to also make you uh, immune to the very similar smallpox virus. Mm. Uh, so the original smallpox vaccine was actually giving you an infection. Mm. Mm. Uh, vaccines have moved on from that. Yeah. You know, that's not that's not really how this modern stuff works. Yeah. There were some headlines that provoked that line of thinking in my mind in the sense from, you know, uh, from the BBC and New York Times about the question about are people infectious after the vaccine? And I think I just misunderstood the headline. Well, but yeah, well, that's the thing. If because of the infectious period of this, uh, mm. uh, 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 well, the period of infectivity and the incubation period, mm. if you got ill with COVID mm. and you're in part of a 10 day incubation period and then day seven, mm. you go in and get your jab. Mm. Uh, it's not like you're going to mysteriously in day eight not be able to make your friends and neighbors sick. Yeah. 
I think that's what they're talking about. Yeah. 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 This is not, I mean, these things take time to work. You know, it's not like if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, already, if you're already sick with, with the, uh, with the disease, this is not going to stop it in its tracks. Okay. All right. Uh, you're still going to probably get sick. You may or may not get as sick as the virus might want to make you. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of different variables there. But if you're already ill, it's not it's not like the vaccines are cured. The vaccines are preventative. And that's part of the thing. We can't necessarily tell, you know, whether everybody everybody in the queue to get a jab is is not infected. That's why you still have to, for example, the, when you go to one of these vaccine centers, everybody's in masks and gloves. So you sort of assume that some of these people coming through have probably got it, you know. And that's why we, you know, oh my God, somebody got the uh, somebody got the jab and still died from the disease. Oh, the uh, uh, the thing is, if you're vaccinating a population full of millions, that's going to happen for several reasons. All right, some people are already going to be sick and have a uh, and be you know, in the process of incubating the infection in their body and be too far gone for the vaccine to help them, and they're going to get sick anyway. Uh, no vaccine is 100% effective, but even if it's 99%, 1% of millions is still going to be, you know, thousands of people getting sick. So we shouldn't just, we shouldn't lose our, our perspective on this. Uh, one of the things people talk about is uh, there's this idea going on, and I've heard this from people on Twitter, that the vaccines uh, will keep you from dying, will keep you from getting really ill, but won't keep you from transmitting the disease. Mm. Now, that's not really true. OK, uh, a lot of that stems from the fact that early on when these vaccines come out and they, a case gets put forward saying, hey, we want you to license a vaccine and we have this data that works. Nobody has any data on whether it prevents trans uh, transmission, because that's much, much, much harder to test both in a laboratory setting and in a general population setting. Uh, it's. Uh, you can only sort of test it now in retrospect by seeing whether transmission in the community is going down. So now we've yeah. got lots of data on this. Uh, but if it prevents serious illness, uh, by definition, is going to reduce transmissibility because although asymptomatic transmission is a thing, you're actually kicking out a lot more viruses if you're coughing and got lung troubles. OK, now, even if it just keeps you to the asymptomatic end of an infection, uh, transmissibility is going to go way down, all right, just as a fact. And all those vaccines are actually very good at keeping people from getting seriously ill, all right? And also, the more ill you are, the longer the window of time that you are, you are contagious, and that window of time is going to go down. So even if some of these vaccines uh, don't work 100% in preventing people from getting this illness and just mitigate the illness, mm -hmm. that is a huge thing. And that will help break that all those different links in that chain of uh, transmission. And I think actually, uh, actually, you're going to see that these vaccines probably are actually very good at breaking transmission that that just nobody had any data to point to at the beginning. And mm -hmm. they would be dishonest in saying, well, we're making promises in the absence of data. Now we're going to start having data because we've got community data and they, we've got yeah. these vaccines being put out. So, yeah. Yeah. So those who get the vaccine shouldn't go and have a massive party. Effectively. Yeah. <laughs> well, well if, you, and if you do get the vaccine, uh, you've got to give it time to work. You know, this idea that all of a sudden it's a silver bullet and you're going to be fine. And you can go straight to the pub tomorrow. Yeah. The yeah. Pfizer vaccine takes about three weeks really to come to peak effectiveness. It looks like mm. uh, I can't remember the, uh, the comparable figures to the other vaccine, but they're probably similar. Mm. So again, we're in a long race here. This is not a, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. So, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we're now at the point where we can see the end here. The end, the end is these vaccines. I, and I think the, the, the struggle is going to be to get the vaccines to everybody. This idea, you know, uh, oh, my God, prisoners are getting vaccines. Well, you can't allow jails to be reservoirs in the middle of your community. And you guess what? You've got people who work in those and go home at night. OK, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, my, oh, my God, Gary Glitter is getting a mm -hmm. vaccine. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Yeah, Gary Glitter deserves to be in prison, but yeah. Gary Glitter was not was not sentenced to death from a, from a, yeah yeah. The state yeah. has a duty of care to that guy, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And more importantly, the state has a duty of care to the uh, to the prison officers and the prison chaplain and the prison mm. doctor mm. and mm. yeah uh, and the guy who drives up and delivers a lorry full of food to the prison. The state has a duty of care to all those people, yeah. and if that means Gary Glitter gets a vaccine, so be it. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because it'll be a dreadful mutation otherwise, wouldn't it? The Wormwood Scrubs variant, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Exactly. And um, yeah, let's talk about the M word, <laughs> the mutations. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, there's a lot of mutations that are kind of cropping up, which is natural, isn't it? Viruses will mutate like crazy. Every few generations, something will look different in the in the genetic code of a virus. Uh, most of these uh, most of these variants are different in ways that really don't matter to to us at all. Um, some of them are actually going to work to our advantage yeah. uh, in, in that something that you know doesn't actually kill the host is actually in the virus's long term interest. Mm. The viruses sort of evolution from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, want to make us sick enough to spread it, but not sick mm. enough to kill off the host. So it's quite possible that over over the next twenty years, this thing may dumb itself down. Yeah. Um, uh, but it w- but it is would be competing with its own own sort of cousins, if you were its own variants that are still deadly. Uh, so for that to happen, a less deadly variant would have to have some sort of competitive advantage. I mean, uh, the Kent variant. So the so-called B117, that was the first one that had us really you know, concerned, had everybody worried because it seems to have some sort of competitive advantage in its infectivity. Now, how much of that is a real thing versus just the timing of it when it came out at a point at which, you know, lockdown was relaxed? Um, I think it's too early to tell. Uh, we have a South African variant. Uh, the concern there is that the spike protein is a, just a little bit different to not work with some of the vaccines. It's, uh, there's some question whether the AstraZeneca vaccine is terribly effective against it. Uh, I mean, but also that's one of the reasons why we've got a lot of vaccines in the in the pipeline. I mean, it's it's an absolute likelihood that the vaccines that we have right now will need a tweak going forward in the future, just like flu vaccines. Mm, and mm. So we're, we're fighting this war with what we have. And it's going to, mm. like I said before, and at the point at which probably a year from now, you know, the people getting a jab now are probably going to need a booster. Mm. Okay. It may very well be that the, the way going forward might be a cocktail of things. I mean, uh, if you, if, if you actually look at, um, what's in a flu jab there's all the uh a flu jab tries to uh prime your immune system against a lot of different variants of the flu okay and so that's probably the that's 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 the thing about variants is, is that we need to watch it and and monitor this um but also we will see fewer variants you know in in form of human disease once we start to break this chain once we start to get more vaccinated people that's back to that chain of infection a vaccinated person is neither a vulnerable host nor a reservoir Mm. okay Mm. so that particular person who's been vaccinated isn't a very good reservoir for the disease and a population where a lot of people are vaccinated that population as a whole as a whole isn't a decent reservoir for the disease. So we're mm. we're by vaccination we're breaking several bits of this this chain of transmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. One um, thing that just totally popped into my head, um, I don't know if it's good or bad, is I remember reading that there was a question about um, you know once you've had the coronavirus yeah. once naturally about like you have a natural immunity for maybe two months. Is there anything like that with the vaccine? The vaccines are 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 clever in that they're designed to produce a stronger reaction than mm-hmm. the actual having the illness would do. Okay, mm-hmm. so the the idea uh, and it gets into sort of your 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 body having different types of antibodies: a short term antibody, a, a one type of immunoglobulin, and a longer term one. But then also having the memory to produce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the vaccines are optimized to induce the, the longer term memory. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about uh, the, the, uh, the, the amount of material that is going into um, to your body, if you, if you get sick from a, if you get sick from the uh, d- disease, all right. Uh, it, it's maybe 500 or a thousand of these virus particles. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so there's that, and that is slowly growing in your system. Okay. And then make it makes you ill. A jab, one of these jabs, is taking uh, like a billion times that 
but just the spike protein part of it. All right. So it's giving you a much, much sharper slap to your uh, system than the gradual buildup that you're getting over that. That's why, there, for example, there's that 10-day, you know, possibly 10-day incubation period before you start to get really sick because this stuff is multiplying, 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 and building up, and you eventually your body's immune system gets overwhelmed. The vaccines, the, the, these types of vaccines are more like a, a really sharp blow that your body's meant to remember for a long time. Got you. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It does. No, it does indeed. There are many conspiracy theories about the COVID vaccine, and I'm sure you know them well. Yeah. Every time I turn around, there's another <laughs> one, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's obviously on Twitter, there's somebody attacking you or something. So, what are your thoughts on these sort of different conspiracy theories, and why do they seem to spread during such uncertain times? Conspiracy theories involving disease are as old as the hills, okay? Mm, mm. Uh, you know, it goes all the way back to let's blame it on the foreigners, let's blame it on, or, you know, frankly, uh, you know, back in the Black Death, it was like let's blame it on the foreigners yeah okay yeah. or worse some of the some of the origins of sort of medieval anti-semitism go to the uh, this idea that somehow these 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 jewish people spread disease and that's uh, uh if you don't understand a phenomenon if you don't understand something you sometimes try to grasp onto some explanation now, now actually how viruses work how viruses spread all this mm. I, I think i've done a good job trying to unpack this but you know uh it's not easy stuff to get your head around. No. And a global pandemic and lockdowns and, you know, all this making everybody's life uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, some people will either consciously or subconsciously seek some sort of reductionist view to explain it all. Uh, whether it's a pandemic or the 9-11 attack mm -hmm. or, you know, Brexit or what have you. So conspiracy theories... I mean, the majority of conspiracy theories try to try to provide a simple explanation behind mm. a complex phenomena. Now, you get the irony in that, you know, once people start teasing out this so-called simple explanation, the, the rationalizations that they have to put in, the things that would have to be true for that mm. simple explanation – Mm. Oh, well, actually, it was all done on a film set in Hollywood um, or whatever, you know, the, the moon <laughs> yeah. landing stuff. Uh, the, yeah. the, 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 you, well, that's one of the side effects of conspiracy theories It's not always, but more often than not, the rationalizations and the, the suppositions and all the things that would have to be true to make the conspiracy theory true end up being as complex or even more complex than the phenomena that they're trying to explain. Yeah. Um, and why that would be any different for coronavirus or the vaccines, you know, of course, it's going to breed conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you, you throw out a few uh, particular things uh, for vaccines. Uh, there's the Wakefield effect. You know, I don't even need to talk too much about uh, Dr. Wakefield and his discredited theories that, you know, the MMR vaccine causes autism uh, and, and and legitimate publications went with that until it got debunked. So the, the modern anti-vaccination stems largely to that. Uh, but then you get into the fact that, gee, who makes vaccines? Pharmaceutical companies. Well, pharmaceutical yeah. companies uh, make easy demons, okay? Uh, we're a little bit shielded from in the UK because, you know, uh, people don't, people in the UK tend to not know what the cost of the medications yeah. are. Uh, or, you know, if you're like me, you pay for your prescriptions. What's it? It's, it's nine pounds flat rate, okay? Mm. Or whatever, whatever it is. And you get a, sa you get a, you get a sack of pills this big for three yeah. months. Um, yeah. Americans will see, it will see the sticker shock. All right. They will see the price and they'll see the uh, what percentage their insurance covers or not. Uh, and they will see the, uh, uh, these filthy bastards that the pharma companies are getting rich. Uh, they are big, wealthy companies and they, uh, they, they don't operate as charities. Uh, so uh, the fact that vaccines by necessity are made, developed and made by pharmaceutical companies, uh, who else is going to make them? Well, research isn't cheap. You know, research isn't cheap. The fact that we're, we're only a year into this and we have vaccines is an absolute effing miracle. OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, and it also kind of shows what what modern science can do if we want to. I mean, the thing is, prior to this sort of thing, vac there's not necessarily a lot of incentive to, to uh, make vaccines. Uh, th there's not a lot of profit margin in a jab that you give somebody once a year versus, uh, uh, versus say, you know, uh, pills for cholesterol and diabetes and, you know, everything else that you take once or twice or three times a day or what have you. There's plenty of money in that, you mm -hmm. know. 
there's not there's not much money in antibiotic development because you might be on antibiotics for two weeks. And then, mm-hmm. But but if you're going to be on a high blood pressure pill every day for the next twenty years, oh, gee, there's money in that. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, if, if if big pharma wanted to really get rich off of this, uh, they want they they want to give us uh, they want to give us they want to give us a single or a double dose of a jab that goes in the arm and we forget about it. They give us they give us three pills and we have to have one with breakfast, one with lunch, one with dinner, and they cost a lot of money. That's the way they would get rich off of this. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, I mean, th- so that's where some of this comes from. Uh, some of this just comes from absolute, you know, for lack of a technical term, batshit looniness. Like, oh yeah, you know, oh, they're going to implant a microchip. Uh, you know, the, the people complaining loudest about they're going to implant a microchip are walking around with uh, you know, a billion microchips or however many in, are in their... Uh, <laughs> well, that that conspiracy. The funny thing is, it's like it's quite an old conspiracy theory. The microchip, one. yeah, it's been around for a good twenty plus years. So, <laughs> well, yeah, the the five G stuff. You know, yeah. uh, you know, five G <laughs> uses a lot less power than four G. Uh, you know, nobody was upset about four G. Before that, nobody. I mean, if any, if if if, if a mobile phone was going to give you brain cancer, yeah. it ought to be one of the big old brick ones that would like a walkie talkie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, remember those? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and some of this stuff is so easily refuted that. I I wonder if it's really just meant to be a gateway to just screen idiots uh, uh, because, <laughs> you know, here, here's you know, a great one I saw was the circuit diagram of the alleged 5G chip that was going the vaccine. And what it actually was, was a schematic for a guitar pedal. <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, That's so funny. and so and just and the stuff like that is designed. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sort of the, the 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 crazy end of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I have my own theories about it. Some of it I think is designed to deliberately screen for the credulous and the stupid. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> the people who are going to research it and the people who are saying that doesn't sound right, you know, um, they're not easily exploited. But the easily exploited could end up forking out a lot of money to Alex Jones and his Infowars subscription services or his mm. stupid brain pills or whatever. Reality medicine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever, 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 <laughs> whatever snake oil he's peddling, you know, because sure as the, sure as the sun rises in the morning, uh, those people spawn their own ecosystem. There's people flogging merchandise to them, you know. If, you, if you're wanting to flog, flog merchandise to the stupid, you want to have mm. mechanisms to, uh, to, to, screen out the smart people who are going to rumble your plot, you know? Mm, mm. Uh, you don't want them coming to the meetings and signing up to your exclusive newsletter, you know? <laughs> no, definitely. Well, one of the other theories, I mean, when we spoke last year, yeah. one of the conspiracy theories has pointed to this sort of secret lab in China um, and somehow COVID yeah. was a bioweapon. Um, maybe just for the benefit of new listeners, why, is, why would COVID make a really bad bioweapon? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and why is the secret lab the one that we, we can find on Google Earth and we all know yeah. about it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very good secret, is it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, bioweapons are designed to, to uh, you know, first of all, biological warfare is largely not a thing that has had much use in the real world because it's actually highly problematic. Yeah. But if you were designing a biological weapon, you would design it for a particular end and for a particular reason to do accomplish some sort of mission. I don't think the Chinese see the making their their worldwide customer base ill in a way that would they would get caught doing serves some sort of end uh, and by doing it so by sort of releasing it in their own city hoping it's going to seep out yeah yeah it just don't, it doesn't make sense from a logistical and operational standpoint i mean when you start looking at history and people who did develop biological weapons that were fortunately not used most biological weapons that were were actually developed for offensive use weren't things that were transmissible from person to person so that you could control where you where, where you applied it so it wouldn't come back and hurt you and if the chinese did this on purpose sure as hell they would have had a vaccine a lot faster you know what you think <laughs> yeah yeah you generally would have a vaccine before you release it wouldn't you <laughs> yeah, or, or, or or at least a couple of candidates in the pipeline so i mean it just doesn't make sense on a big i mean what is the end of it i mean mm. these sort of conspiracy theories sort of mm. operate on a sort of continuum from just barely plausible at one end to, you know, the David I bat shit, you know, mm. sheep shifting mm. lizards on the other end. Mm. Uh, so maybe we can come up with a unit of measurement. How many Ikes, you know, yeah. stuff at the most plausible end is like, is it possible that that the Chinese had discovered this, were, uh, you know, floating around in the wild, we're worried about it, we're working on it in a lab, and it somehow got out? Plausible? 
I don't think so. There's not been a compelling case where that's the mm. that's the reason. A lot of that has to do with what by looking at the what we call, uh, call the phylogeny. Uh, there's a there's a big you know ten dollar word that they used to say. Um, if, if we're talking about strains and variants and, uh, and and the genetic code of viruses, a phylogeny a phylogeny is like looking at the family tree. Okay, and by look, and you can start calculating backwards. Okay, how many generation changes does it take to have a little twist in the RNA? Yeah, and it's quite possible that this, uh, you know, people are pretty sure, not hundred percent, that you know this thing came from bats. Okay, somehow it got from bats to humans. There's a theory that came from bats to humans via pangolins. Okay, but. Some of the calculations on this, the calculations on this uh, put that leap from bat to human, you know, as early as the 1930s. OK, now that's sort of the er- that's the earliest end of a possible band of things. But the later mm. end is like the 1980s. Mm. Our understanding of viruses and genetic technologies uh, are such that these guys weren't making that happen in the 1980s because the tools didn't exist for that. And even today, a virologist can look at, you know, how a virus you know, exists. And yes, it's capable. Uh, we are capable of making man-made viruses, but they look like, they look like, it's like, it's like comparing a Model A Ford to a horse. You can mm-hmm. look at a Model A Ford and say, you know what? Somebody's made pieces and put that together. Nobody made the horse. The horse was made by nature. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and we're still yeah. kind of at that level of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 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 we're, we're, we're at that level of artificial virus versus natural virus. And every virologist I've ever talked to, I must have talked to 20 over the last year, says, there's no way that this is just a stitched together man made thing. Okay. So I discount these theories. Part of it comes to the fact that, you know, China is a, China is a good villain to have in, uh, conspiracy theories. There are reasons why you might want to make China the villain. You know, China's up to no good in the, you know, in Xinjiang and oppressing the Uyghur population and things like that. And there's reasons, you know, it's not, it's not a free country. There's a re- there's reasons why you, you, you can dislike the Chinese regime. But, you know, I got accused of being a Chinese spy for saying I didn't think it was a, a Chinese plot. Uh, you know, <laughs> But also, yeah. you start to think about it. Yeah. You know, China is the most populous country in the world. It's a country where you do have a lot more, you know, rough and crude interface at the market level between livestock mm. and people. Mm. Okay, and that's mm. something that we may need to address. Yeah. You know, um, it gives more opportunity. You know, uh, for for this stuff to go to go global. So, so it's the the wet markets they reference, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah, is there really a consensus yet on um, the origins of COVID? Because I know the World Health Organization have been investigating potential origins in China. There, there's a rough consensus. Uh, uh, there's a rough consensus that this thing came from bats somehow. Some uh, and mm-hmm. a lot of peer reviewed science, like I said, looking at the genetic code and trying to figure out roughly how long ago that leap happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I said, that leap happened too far in the past to have really been an artificially induced one. I think um, there's a lot of there's the, there's a lot of consensus that uh, of where the index case was the first guy to have this. Mm-hmm. Okay, it doesn't mean that he really was the first guy, but he was the first guy to make other people sick. Okay, yeah. uh, that's the thing. I p- there's a lot of people who get sick from it. Don't make anybody else sick, but there's other people who make a lot of people sick. And it, you know, there's been some studies where, in particular, sample populations, sixty percent of the people who were in, who got ill didn't make anybody sick, but five percent got a shit ton of people sick. Okay, <laughs> now that, you know, that's why that R number that R number is an average. Okay, uh, it's not a it's not a hard and fast thing. It's a you know colossal average over a large population. So, you know, the consensus takes a long time in science. Uh, you know, people are just now getting over cons- getting consensus over things like, gee, uh, was the Great Plague in uh, in London in the 1660s, was it caused by fleas or lice? <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. <laughs> the consensus is shifting to lice from, from, from fleas on that yeah. one. You know, uh, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> oh, man. It reminds me of a very weird thought I had. Um, Back in what was it? Was it late December or January? I was just look over. It was a dark evening overlooking the Thames. I kind of figured you haven't really lived in London until you've lived through a plague. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> so we've done it. <laughs> yes, there you have it. <laughs> you know, Charles Dickens went through it. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, we're not. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we're not going to have another great fire. There's too much concrete. There's a mm. there's a fire brigade. You know, uh, there's building codes and smoke detectors. So the great fire yeah. is out. But yeah, hey, plagues are on. <laughs> 
Oh dear. Well, well, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today? No, I think uh, I think I've. Um, I mean, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to get through to the hard cases on this. But if uh, what I've said can persuade anybody uh, who wasn't going to get the vaccine to get the vaccine, that's a good thing. Mm. I mm. think starting from next week in Central London, there's a there's a small chance it might be me sticking a jab in the arm because I'm in the process of getting hired as an NHS part time vaccinator. Um, so. I'm I'm heading straight to the front of this war, so that's how we're going to get through it. If it's me sticking a needle in your arm, that's yeah. that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. That's brilliant. You know, that's really good. Well, look. Um, one actually, one very random question. Feel free to completely uh, yeah. uh, say no to it. Um, as an educated guest, because one of the big questions is when when will life return back to normal? Will it ever turn back? Return back to normal? What would you? What would your? If somebody asked you that in a pub, what would your kind of educated kind of guess be on on something? Like oh, that? a pub! <laughs> oh, there was this thing called a pub. I know. I forgot those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you and I are having a Guinness right now, what would you say? To oh me? yeah, not even not even out of a can on a park bench. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, you know. This summer, probably. Uh, yeah. I'm not uh, not the point where I'd say book a foreign holiday. They, uh, that might still be prob- problematic. But I'm I'm hoping that you know at least domestically here in the UK we'll break the back of it by this summer. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. And you were saying earlier as well about like obviously some developing countries might take a while to get the vaccine yeah. and all that. So there might be some countries that might be. I don't know what months or do you think a year? Or I, 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 I'm going to think this is going to run. Uh, this is going to this is going to run well into next year in terms of places like Africa and you mm. know and India and places like that. Mm. Uh, and we're going to have to have some serious you know travel quarantine measures to various countries. We're going to probably have a whole color code chart of uh, of, of countries and associated testing uh, regimes if you go to and from them and all that. And that's going to go on for a couple of years, I think. I think that's just mm. going to be the the, the name of the game. Um, and like I said, there's going to be an annual arms race with uh, with improving and tweaking booster shots. So this is mm. going to, you know, yeah, get used to having an annual booster for a couple of years at least, I think, mm. To, mm. to keep on top of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Then you can go to the pub. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Cool. Well, well, Dan, thank you so much for today. Uh, where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Well, I'm most easily found. Uh, I'm most easily found on Twitter. Dan D A N K A S Z E T A. I'm the only Dan Kazita on Twitter, except no substitutes. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty good on that Twitter feed, as sort of signposting people to you know the mm. book that I wrote, yeah. uh, the articles I write, things like that. That's uh, yeah. My Twitter account is the gateway to Dan Kazita. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.